We're continuing here in 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 16 for tonight, dealing with a topic that's all throughout this epistle, and that's the topic of love. You know, God is love, and if we are his children, then he expects us to be epistles of love, children of love, saints of love. And love is our trademark. That is our branding, so to speak, in this world. And that is what sets us apart. Jesus said, you know, among the Gentiles, they love to rule and exercise authority over one another. And he said, it's not going to be so among you. When we come together, we come out of mutual submission, first to God and then to each other. Submission to his words, submission to the Holy Spirit. There's no man that's exalted above another. It's God and God alone in our midst, midst that we focus on. And so in dealing with this love here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, I want to talk about something tonight that I know I need to think a lot more about. And I think we as Christians, as salt and light in this world, need to think a lot more about. And it starts here in verse 16 where he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. All right, so if you want to identify the love of God, if you want to look around and try to find the love of God, this is the identifier. This is how you locate the love of God. Because he did what? He laid down his life for us. And because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for one another. And it really is a, a consequence. It's, it should be something that flows out of our heart. When you realize how much you have been forgiven, when you realize that you deserve hell, when you deserve the judgment of God, and you realize how much he has loved and forgiven and sought after you when you were rejecting him, and when that love becomes real in your heart, in that moment of being just overwhelmed of how gracious and kind he is, it should melt you and you want to do that for other people. That's what you want to extend to others. You want to love as he has loved you. John 15, verse 12, Jesus said it this way. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And next week, I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more because Romans states that all of the law is fulfilled in this one commandment to love one another, right? And so he goes on and he says there in Romans, you know, you have the laws of, you know, do not steal, do not kill, do not bear false witness, do not covet. And um, so as you're involved in relationship, you can be thinking to yourself, okay, I can't steal from this person, I can't kill this person, I can't slander against this person. You, you know, you can try to concentrate on all of the negatives, or you could just concentrate on the one positive, I'm going to love you. And that takes care of all of the negatives, doesn't it? I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to bless you instead of curse you. You love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment. This is what Jesus wants you to do. And so this includes caring for other brothers and sisters. This includes evangelism, reaching the lost. This includes reaching out to the destitute and the helpless. But if you want to know God, what am I supposed to be doing in this world? What is my mission here on earth? This is his commandment, that you what? That you love one another as I have loved you. So, are you a child of love? Does love really have its stamp upon your life? If a newspaper article was going to be written about you, if you were going to stand in a courtroom and a ruling was to be made about you and your character, would it be that you are a person of love? Does love just kind of ooze out from you? This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man do, do what? He lays down his life for his friends. And this is the part that I think we need to talk about a little bit tonight. Biblical love, if you're going to truly love, there's always sacrifice in that love. In fact, if there's no sacrifice, there's no love at all. I put there in your notes, it could, in fact, be flattery and manipulation. 
Some people, you know, sometimes they will act all nice to get on your good side to play the politics game, social engineering, you know, and they will flatter you, or, but it's all in an attempt to manipulate you, to get you to do what they want you to do. There's, there's a hook behind, behind the uh, compliment. And uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an action that we do for others that really causes us to sacrifice something. And I put there in your notes, you know, sometimes sacrifice, we think of sacrifice and we think of the soldier dying on the battlefield, right? Or someone diving in front of a racing car to save someone's life. Or, and it, it does, it includes all of that for sure. But that doesn't make us exempt in the day-to-day when we don't have, you know, great events like that happening all the time. What, what do you do in the mundane? And I put there, uh, there in the notes, from day to day, you and I are called upon to make sacrifices in our time, sacrifices in our schedule, our energy, our convenience, our money, our personal preferences. You know, I, I titled this tonight, Whom Did You Love Today? Let's say it this way. Whom did you sacrifice for today? And all of you... Moms can just kind of be excluded because we know who you sacrifice for. You give your lives for your family, and that's great. So for you, sacrifice is kind of a built-in job, isn't it? But for uh, some of the rest of us, this is something we've got to think about. You know, the whole thing about loving is when you walk away from loving that person, you have given away something. You, you walk away lighter. You now don't have what you had five minutes ago. You expended energy. You may have given them money. You certainly gave them your time that you'll never get back. You gave them your support. You listened to them. You gave them your full attention. You gave them some counsel. You gave them, you know, a testimony of what the Lord has done for you. You've sacrificed. You've given something to them. And those things are very real and very meaningful to God. God watches over your every action and all of your words and all of your relationships, and he takes note And believe me, there's a list of the sacrifices you have made for others. And so, when you're with your family or when you're with your coworkers or whatever you're doing, even when you're driving down the highway, we've got to start training our minds, how do I love this other person? How do I give to them? You can give to them by letting them in the lane instead of cutting them off, you know? Does it make you mad when someone wants to chisel in front of you and you've been sitting there in line for five minutes and they come zooming up on the side and they just want to, you know, butt in the line? Uh, that's a good chance to exercise some patience and long-suffering and mercy that they don't deserve, and, right? Lots of different ways that we can give. And instead of just going through a day thinking about ourselves and me and how does this affect me, and I'm not happy now, and I'd rather be doing this. And instead of all being so self-absorbed, every time you come across another human being, that's an opportunity for you to think, how can I love them? How can I give to them? How can I walk away with something that I didn't have five minutes ago because I gave it to this person? That's what we're talking about. And then the, you know, the big three that I always kind of harp on, If you want to know really where your heart is and what you believe in life, just examine your time, your energy, and your money. And those three things will tell you every time where your heart is. And if you're really willing to sacrifice and give to other people. And sometimes we're giving time that we don't have, and sometimes we're giving energy that we don't have, and sometimes we're giving money that we really don't have to give, but we're going to give it anyway because it's a sacrifice. And that mode of living sacrificially for others is where God wants to take us. I also put in your notes, just so we understand, there is a balance to this, isn't there? You can't just keep giving, giving, giving all the time. There's times when you have physical sickness or fatigue. Sometimes you just have mental or emotional fatigue and you need to take a break. And we see that in Jesus' life here in Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, the multitude. After ministering to the multitudes, can you imagine how exhausted he must have felt? What a drain that must have been on his spirit and his emotions. And it says he went up into a mountain apart to do what? 
to pray. So this, ne- this wasn't even me time necessarily. This was time to get refilled so he could go out and give some more. But I just wanted that balance to be spoken tonight that there are times when you do need to take care of yourself and you do need to break away and get in the presence of God or get rest, get whatever you need to get refreshed and then go hit it again. It says he went up into a mountain apart to pray and when the evening was come, he was there what? Alone. It's hard to find times of solitude, but boy, it's important. There's times when it's quiet Nobody's needing a piece of you for anything. Really hard for moms, but it's so desperately needed. You just need that quiet time, sometime during the day where it's just you and God, and you don't have to think. You can just worship and listen to your Father, and you don't have to do anything. You can just sit quietly and let all of the internal turmoil come to rest. And those are great times in the presence of the Lord. And you need that to be able to continue giving out sacrificially in love. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, moving on. But whoso has this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? See, love is tangible. Love is not a Hallmark card. Love is not a feeling or an emotion. Love is not sweet words. Love, there's action. It's that goodness in action, that act of kindness where you're giving. My little children, let us not love in word. And I think it's understood there that what he's saying is let us not love in word only. People do need to hear you say, I love you. They need need that verbal affirmation, confirmation of your love. So he's saying, let us not love in word only, neither in tongue only, as a hypocrite. But there's got to be substance behind the words. Let us love in deed and in truth. So as you look back over today, do you have deeds today? Things that you can look and say, you know, I did that for my colleague. I did that for my spouse. I did that for my family. I did that for that stranger that I don't know. I I gave of myself today. I took of my time, my energy, and I sacrificed for someone else. And it really helps you, you know. There's nothing more deadly than just that self-absorbed mindset where all you're thinking about is yourself. I put there, faith and works are inseparable. You know, sometimes when we're talking about salvation, we say that you can't be saved by works, but you can't be saved without works either. And that's kind of a mind-bender But really, it comes down to this truth. Faith and works are inseparable. You will do what you believe. And if you're not doing it, it's because you really don't believe it. You know? If we really believed that people who are not saved will someday die and be tormented for all of eternity in a devil's hell, if we really believed that, then we would be more serious about sharing Jesus with people that were lost. But when we're afraid or hold back or don't do it, how much do we really believe it? I mean, if if you were in a building and it caught on fire, would you leave not warning anybody, thinking, oh, they'll just mock me, make fun of me, they won't really believe it? Or maybe, maybe it's not a real fire, maybe it's just an imaginary fire. You know, it, it's ludicrous. If you really believe it, you're going to do it, right? Faith and works are inseparable. Love is not measured by an emotion or what you say. Love is measured by what you no longer have. I don't have that 10 minutes. I don't have that hour. I don't have that $50. I don't have that energy (laughs) that I just gave away. So that's how love is measured. What did you give away today? What did you do for someone else? James chapter 2, verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, Be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What is it? Profit. Was that really love? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is what? Is dead, being alone. And if love does not have actions of kindness, then it's not really love. If there's not sacrifice in the giving, not 
big, life-altering sacrifices. We're talking about your time, your energy, your money, the simple things, the mundane, the day-to-day -day things. We've got to know how to give. And we've got to know how to give to our family, to our friends, colleagues, strangers alike. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. This is the next chapter over in 1 John that we're studying. But this is all throughout the book. In this was manifested the love of God, because that God did what? He sent his son. So how do we know that God loves? Because there was action, there was a deed, there was something that confirmed the love. He sent, he did without, he gave up his son. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he did what? He sent his son. So what action do you have? What fruit do you have that you are a lover? Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now going back to 1 John chapter 3, very important principle here as he goes on, verse 19, and hereby we shall know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says this, Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Do you all ever, I, I know I do, plenty of times, do you all ever go through times of doubt? Or maybe insecurity? Gee, I wonder if I'm even right with God. I wonder if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I wonder if I'm even saved. Or, you know, How do you know that you are of the truth? How is it that you can assure your heart before him? What will assure your heart? How can you examine yourself, whether you be in the faith? How can you prove your own self? Well, hereby we know that we are of the truth. Hereby what? Hereby is a continuation from verse 18. So what, what's verse 16, 17, 18 talking about? Loving one another. Loving one another not just in word, but in deed and in truth. So how do you know that we are of the truth? When you're going through those moments of doubt or insecurity and you think, I wonder if God's even alive in me. I wonder if I'm growing spiritually. I wonder if I'm right with God. If you can think back over your day and think how your heart just went out to that homeless person and you gave them something to eat for lunch or your heart just went out to a sister or brother in the Lord that's going through this trial and, and you prayed with them and gave them a scripture and, and your heart went out to your, to your own child as you had to discipline them and love them and share with them how much you love them. And if you can go back through the day and think of moments where you had to give sacrificially your time, your energy, your attention, your money, maybe, that's how you assure your heart. Because a person does not love without the Spirit of God living in them. So if you have fruit... If you have events like that during the day that you can look back on and remember when your heart was touched and when you were moved with compassion and, and you did it even though you didn't feel like it and you did it even though you didn't have time and you did it even though you were dog tired but you did it for the good of that other person, then you can assure your heart, that was God living in me. That was God working in me. That, that was not the action of a selfish person. So he's saying here in verse 19, this is a good thing. This is how you can have confidence that you're right with God and God is living and moving in you. That's how you can examine yourself. And here in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, I want to go through this quickly because it's lengthy, but you all know the story. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to in inherit eternal life? This is a big question. And again, this goes back to 1 John 3, 19, how can we assure our hearts before him? How do we know that we're saved? How can we have this eternal life? And he said, what's written in the law? What do you read when you read it? And he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. Now, doesn't that sound, that sounds really high and religious and so philosophical and right but how do you do that what does it mean to love God with all my heart with all my soul how do I do that well he's going to go on and he says and love thy neighbor as thyself so your love 
when you give to someone else in a tangible way, that is you loving God. That is your heart responding to how God has loved you and now you're passing on what you've been freely given. To love your neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt have that eternal life. This becomes very important as we'll see in a few minutes on Judgment Day. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Human nature always looks to the loophole, doesn't it? This isn't really going to cost me something, is it? Isn't there a way I can get out of this? Isn't there some escape clause that am I really going to be held responsible for this? Yes, you are. And you and I are going to be responsible for how we treat the people around us. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw it, he passed by on the other side. Maybe he was going to the temple. Maybe he was going to prayers. Maybe he was just too religious to help. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now see, a, a priest and a Levite, I, I don't think Jesus chose those two by chance, do you? These were people that were pillars in the community. They were looked up to. They were moral. They were religious. They, they, they took the moral high ground. They were the religious standard and model for everyone. And here they don't even have compassion on someone. And Jesus is trying to say, it doesn't matter how religious you are. Do you want eternal life? Do you want to know that you're right with God? Do you want to know that God is living inside of you? There's one way to find out. How do you treat those around you? Is your life filled with acts of kindness? Are you willing to take of yourself and give to someone else? Then a certain Samaritan, and you know this was ticking off the Jews, right? I mean, Samaritans were dogs as far as the Jews were concerned. Mixed breed, low lives. Uh, they wouldn't even look at a Samaritan if they passed them on the road. But a certain Samaritan, so Jesus chose someone who the Jews hated. He just used a priest and a Levite as an example, and they failed the test. You know, the righteous, the religious. And then he uses what in their eyes was nothing but a dog, and when this dog saw him, he had what? He had compassion on him. And Jesus is saying, this dog with compassion is more right with God than the religious priest and Levite. Than the one who memorizes the scriptures, knows what the law says, the one that daily does all of the rites and rituals that you have to do. But he said, it's not them that are right with God. It's the Samaritan dog who had what? Who had compassion. Who had love. You know, it's just, sometimes I have to scratch my head when you look across the body of Christ and you, you see so much fighting within the church today. It's just, you know, and you do have to stand up for sound doctrine and you do have to stand up against sin I'm not minimizing any of that. There's, there are times when you draw lines in the sand. But a lot of the fighting that I see in the church today is nothing but pride and ego. It's not love. And God is not honored and God is not at work in those lives. I don't care how many scriptures they quote, how many Levites they are, I don't care what they do religiously, if you, don't have, if you can't move with compassion, God is not in you, period. And this is what Jesus and John are trying to get across. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence. Do you know how much two pence is? Does anybody know? I didn't know till this afternoon. But two pence 
is two days' wages. So if you think about you know, how much you make per hour or how much you make in a day and double it, that would be two pence. That was a lot of money. Uh, that's a lot of money when you don't have very much. That, that'd be a lot of money for us. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, two days' wages, and gave them to the host and said, take care of them. And then he writes a blank check. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come, I will repay thee. Didn't even set a limit. Didn't even cap it off. Said, whatsoever you spend more. Why? Because he was, just, he was so moved by what this man had been through and how he was beaten and broken. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy. It wasn't the Levite and it wasn't the priest. It wasn't the ones who knew the law backward and forward. It wasn't the ones who went to the temple and went through all of the rituals and rites. It wasn't the religious. It wasn't the moral, you know, uh, pillars of the community. It was the one who had compassion. And he said, go and do thou likewise. Verse 20, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knoweth all things. And I put this in there because sometimes we, go, we do go through doubt and we wonder, am I doing the right thing? Am I growing? Do I really hear from God? Do I really love God? Am I following God? Is God living inside of me? And I just wanted to remind you from Revelation 12, verse 10, we do have an accuser of our brethren. We do have Satan. Remember what he did to Job? He accused Job to God, and he said, God, this man will curse you to your face. Did Job ever do that? No. This was an outright lie, a fabrication, an accusation. And that is what Satan does. And many times when you're feeling discouraged or doubtful, it's because of the warfare that's going on in the spiritual realm around you. And Satan is accusing you. And he wants to defeat you in your own mind and thoughts. And he wants you to give up. And so that's why verse 20 is written, for if our heart condemn us, God is what? He's greater than our heart. And if you're going, if you're going through that doubt or insecurity and you're in that warfare of accusation, God knows all things. And God is telling you that if your heart is a heart that can be moved with compassion to acts of kindness for others, then God is in you. This is what 1 John is all about. So you don't have to doubt. You don't have to worry. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than your heart. He knows all things. Yeah, He knows all of the struggles. He knows all of the battles. He knows how you deal with this lust or these thoughts or that anger or this fear. God knows all of that. And he's telling you, you are right with God and he's inside of you and you are learning, you are growing in God if there's compassion in your heart and you love those that are around you and you try to help those that are around you and if you give of yourself to those that are around you. That's a great assurance, isn't it? He's telling you how you can get rid of all of that doubt and fear. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, if we can come to that place of realizing, wow, God must be working in me because I do have that compassion and I do have love, then we have what? We have confidence towards God. And I can go and worship and I can pray and I don't have to shrink back and I don't have to hide and I've got a clear conscience that God is working in me. I do experience being moved with compassion. I, I do want to help others. I, I want them to know the Jesus that I know. And, and yeah, I mess up at times. And yeah, I don't do or say everything right. And yeah, my flesh gets the better of me from time to time. But you know what? This love that I have in my heart for others is the sign and the seal of God that he's alive in me and working. So I can have confidence when I go to my Father. Paul said it this way, Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards who? Towards men. Are you clear in your conscience right now that you did nothing to offend or to put a stumbling block in front of someone else today? 
And if you did, are you going to make it right? Are you going to go back and ask their forgiveness and say, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. I was provoking you. I was putting a stumbling block in front of you that could cause you to fall. So exercise yourself in this conscience every day. Am I loving this person? What can I do for this person today? How can I give to this person today? How can I make their day a better day today? And it's important because of Matthew 25, verse 31. And we'll end with this. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory and before Him shall be gathered all nations and He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Now how is He going to judge and divide the sheep from the goats? You know, is it, is it going to be a system of metrics of well, you know, this guy kept six out of ten commandments, so maybe he's a sheep. This guy kept four out of ten, so he must be a goat. Is that how we do it? He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goat's on the left. This is how Jesus is going to make those determinations. It's not based on metrics. It's not based on keeping rules. Look at what it's based on. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you did what? You gave me meat. Now see, this is not some huge life-altering sacrifice, right? This is not you diving on a hand grenade in the battlefield, right? This, someone was hungry, and you reached into your brown bag and took out an apple, and you gave it to them. You did something for someone else. You thought of someone else other than yourself. There was an act of kindness that was involved. I was thirsty and you did what? You, well, how hard is that? But you know, sometimes we walk through this fog of being so self-absorbed, we don't even see or notice that they're hungry or thirsty. And this is what Jesus is trying to break us out of. He's trying to break us out of that selfishness to actually look and observe and to see someone in pain or to see someone hungry or thirsty and do something for it. You gave me drink and I was a stranger. You took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. You know, for those of you that have visited Ruth and those of you who haven't, no problem. I'm not saying anything about that. It's uh, this last journey that she had down in Arlington, I never made it down there either, so I understand. For those of you that went to visit her, I want you to know, every time you visited her, Jesus took note. Because that was you sacrificially giving time and energy, giving to her to help her. By the way, I have talked to her on the phone, and she said to tell you that she loves you all, and she's really, she thinks about you all the time. Um, and hopefully you got that email from Priya. Now she's down in Fredericksburg, so that's even further away. But if you can, if you have five minutes during the day, I would just really ask you to give her a call and pray with her. Uh, that means so much to her. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, or fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? Now, the righteous ones are saying, what are you talking about, Lord? When did we do this? That tells me two things about these people. That tells me, number one, they were not do it, doing it for any credit. You know, they were not keeping count of, well, I did this and I did that. And they were not keeping track. They weren't doing it for their own good, for selfish gain, for their own credit so that they would get the trophy. They were doing it because they were compelled to. They were moved with compassion. The second thing that it tells me is they just did it naturally. Because they were children of God, this just kind of flowed out of their heart. They didn't even have to think about it. It was natural to them as children of love, children of God. It wasn't something that they had to manufacture or make themselves do. It was because of the Spirit of Christ living in them. And so when he, when he addressed them this way, he thought, what did we do? We were just doing what came natural to us, what just flowed out of our heart. We were just doing what God did to us. 
When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? When saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. And that is important to make a note. It's not necessarily the pretty people or the wealthy, even though we don't want to leave them out either. But what he's saying here is, you know, sometimes when you do it to the wealthy or to the pretty people, you do it for what you can get out of it. You know, you're thinking, geez, if, if I'm nice to this wealthy guy, you know, if I return the lost wallet, maybe he'll give me all of the $100 bills that were in the wallet, right? And so we, it's not, we're not really doing it out of love or sacrifice or because we're concerned for them. We're doing it for reward back to us. But when you do it to the least, you're not expecting anything back, right? You're just doing it out of the kindness and the goodness of your heart. When you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now in this judgment that we're going through here, do you see anywhere where he says, Okay, commandment number seven, you failed. Commandment number six, you were okay. You know, you did it most of the time. Commandment number eight, man, you need to go back to school. You just completely missed that one. It's, it's not an itemized list of rules, is it? What is this judgment based upon? How you treat other people. Do you love other people? When you come in contact with someone, whether it's the checkout lady at the grocery store, or whether it's uh, you know, the guy at the gas station that, that inspects your car, whether it's the Starbucks barista, whether it's a waiter in the restaurant, whether it, no matter who it is, whether it's your own child or your own family or a friend, how do you treat them? When you encounter them, do you wish to give them something? Do you wish to impart to them good, kindness, God, a word of encouragement? And so he said to them on the left, depart from me, you are cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. You didn't clothe me, you didn't visit me. They come up with the same question, but from a diff much different heart attitude. Lord, when did we see you hungry or stranger or naked or sick or in prison? He says this, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. That kind of, that gives us a whole nother basis for how we evaluate our life, doesn't it? It's not, did I keep rule number six, seven, and eight? It's now, am I loving and giving to those that I encounter on a daily basis? And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into what? Into life eternal. So back to the title for tonight, whom did you love today? Are you here tonight with something that you used to have, but you don't have now because you gave it away? 20 minutes of your time, some energy, some money, some strength, some insight, some encouragement. What did you give away to help someone else? That's what Jesus is looking for. Father, thank you for explaining to us in your word how you want us to live, how you want us to give. Father, help us to remember that sacrifice is not only in the big things, sacrifice is in the small things too. It's a smile here. It's a word of encouragement there. It's giving someone a scripture. It's giving them that, that glass of cold water. It's giving them our full attention instead of just rote answers. Father, help us to truly, every time we encounter a person, to ask the question, what can I give to them from God? How does God want to use me in this life? even if it's just a two-minute encounter. Let us always be looking around us, aware, 
And Father, teach us how to give instead of being so self-absorbed. And Father, as we go, we ask for your safety, for your protection. Bring us back Sunday to worship you again. I pray for each person here that your presence would surround them, that your presence would invade their hearts, fill them up to the brim to overflowing. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.